The Digital Vans Triple Crown of Surfing returns to the North Shore this December, but I'm sure that you know that already because we have been looking forward to it and talking about it for the past few weeks. The event begins on December 21st, and it runs through January 21st, so one full month. And of course, it is at the three historic surf venues that you would expect from the Triple Crown, the Vans Hawaiian Pro at Haleiwa, the Vans World Cup of Surfing at Sunset Beach, and of course, the Vans Pipe Masters. Vans will award individual event titles to the men and women, but they'll also reward an overall Vans Triple Crown champ. So if you're an athlete and you're interested in competing, registration is open until December 15th at VansTripleCrownOfSurfing.com. You can also follow all of the action there and, of course, on Instagram at Vans Triple Crown of Surf. I will, of course, be posting to it on Instagram as well at Surf Splendor. And I've mentioned a couple of key partnerships these last couple of weeks. There's another one that you should be aware of, and that is the North Shore Community Land Trust. They have worked with Vans for many years as a key environmental partner. The North Shore Community Land Trust strives to protect, steward, and enhance the natural landscapes, cultural heritage, and rural character of Ahupua's from Kahuku Point to Kayena on the North Shore of Oahu. North Shore Community Land Trust was founded by a grassroots group of community members in 1997 as a nonprofit organization concerned with protecting and restoring the scenic beauty of the North Shore. This is a key partnership for Vans. And in that amount of time, they've actually raised $75 million towards the perpetual protection of over 4,000 acres of North Shore lands, helping to secure the rural character of the North Shore for future future generations. This is a phenomenal project, fantastic for anybody who cares about the North Shore community and about Hawaii and of course about surf culture. And you can learn more about it at northshorelands.org and of course vans triple crown of surfing.com. Couple of orders of business today. Let's start off with uh, catching up. Last time the listeners heard you, just you and I talking was December 2018. Yep. It was yep. the last episode I published of the year, which was very raw and vulnerable. And you really went there. And the day I talked to you on the phone the day before, you were telling me about what was going on in your personal life. And I was like, hey, dude, if you want to like not record tomorrow and get through what you're going through, we can revisit this next year. And you're like, no, I'm, I'm fine. And you brought it. You were raw. What's the response been to that podcast since uh, then? It, it, it's two-sided. It's two-sided. It's sort of like exposing yourself in public. <laughs> and so there was a real lot of empathy. There was a lot of understanding. People go, I get it. Yeah, you've been a bit, bit not yourself the last 12 months or so. So we understand that. But I guess it's the people that pull me up in supermarkets and like down at Bell's, people I've never met before and go, hey, great podcast and sort of put their arm around me. And I realised, damn, everybody knows sort of a lot of my dirty laundry now. So there was a there was a there was a time there where I was actually sort of felt like running and hiding again. But you know, the reality is that you know I went home in December and you know I virtually lived it. I lived the even when I was here in February and did the other one with you and Chaz. I mean, it, it, I was still coming to grips with. I've actually said it and put it out there, and I've got to go home now and actually live, living apart, you know, getting quite funny. Uh, I'm living with a guy called Sean Doherty now. We've split a house, which is just a, an incredible dynamic, you know. But, yeah. but you know, to, to actually say, oh, yeah, it's, it was all good, you know, because I actually said it and, you know, I'm living it. But every day, like yesterday being Mother's Day, yeah, it, it brings everything from the the whole spectrum of life to love to really disappointment to a bit of, I was a bit angry yesterday and so there, there's still turmoil but you know there's 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 glints of 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 sort of yeah you got me on this optimism one. yeah look I'm sort of always optimistic but one of the things with with depression is is that you know it's that little voice on your shoulder and i got to be really really careful to differentiate the voices the ones that are putting me down and the ones that i mean i think we're going to get onto this and 
The ones are going, don't listen to that. You're fine. You're okay. This is who you are. This is what you're going to do. This is what you do. You help people. You go out there. And, and originally, that's what it's for. Is In this day and age now, and, you know, everyone looks at smartphones, we, we've become... We've become a society of people living in their own little bubbles, hmm. and we don't communicate uh, with each other like we used to. And it always seems to take a crisis or something incredible to happen, you know, like a some major happy event in your life or some major sad event. But the actual living of every day, every hour, I, I've always I don't listen to music in the car, I don't listen to podcasts. When I walk around, I don't take my iPhone with me. I really like looking at things. I like meeting people, you know, I, uh, depending on how I'm feeling at the time. So th- there's all sorts of things in today where, you know, we were just talking about then about the, the negatives of technology and, and monopolies. And there's so much out there that, you know, if I have a down moment for an AR, I can spiral down and just see everything that's negative on the planet and then all of a sudden just realize where are you going with this you're going to this really really dark place again a Mm. really dark place and it's not a happy place it's a it's a it's a very very dark place and you need coping mechanisms to to pull yourself out And, and a lot of the time it might be just someone being nearby and that's what i always found with my wife you know like When I'd be down and out, she'd be there, but you know, she's not there anymore, and um, so it's 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 not easy. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you. Um, Firstly, you're talking about depression. Have you been diagnosed with with depression? Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, and then secondly, do you treat it with medicine, and then what uh, behaviors do you put into place, or systems do you put into place to kind of keep you out of that funk? Okay. Yep. I went undiagnosed for about 30-something years. Uh, I went to a counsellor. I think I've sort of said this. I got diagnosed with pretty bad depression from when I was in jail in my 20s. So it had been untreated for a very long time. So a lot of people that knew me uh, would, would go, yeah, watch it when you poke the bear. Gee, when the bear comes out, he gets angry. He comes out, you know, when I'm cornered and I feel insecure or, uh, lack of low self-esteem because I feel someone's putting shit on me, you know. So I'll actually come out fight. And part of that was was the the post-traumatic stress disorder picking up, going to jail. You know, I did a deal <laughs> that I'd get out straight away. You know, I'd spend enough every day reporting the police for twenty-two hours. So hey. Yeah, should have been all good, but it wasn't. And the the kid they let out of jail has never recovered. I've coped and I've used the things and the positives, but there's still that thing right down there. So this, I actually went to a psychiatrist about two years ago and I went through some stuff because I was having trouble with my family and it was that was two years ago. I was first trouble with my wife and I was actually just... I wasn't sort of getting it. It was like there was some other thing yeah, with family and kids. And, you know, I want to be the, the all protective father, grandfather, you know, the head of the family, the patriarch. But it sort of wasn't working out that way. So I ended up going again and she pulled it apart until the air. I was three and I was traumatized when I was three because I was dressed up in a place called Ballarat, which is an old gold field. Gold, gold fields just it's where I was uh, spent the first four years of my life with my adopted parents. And they dressed me up as a Chinaman because it was sort of cute because I was a different dark-looking kid. And I can still remember that. And I actually go, go back and remember that. And then about six months later, I ran away from home. Imagine that, three and a half years. The police got me about two and a half mile up the road, hitchhiking to an airport, uh, to the local Ballarat airport, somehow to escape to Sydney. Wow. So all of those things coupled with, you know, being shown the orphanage, you know, because I was a pretty wild kid because, you know, the the genetics was already set. Um, So anyhow, so really long story short is that I ended up uh, being diagnosed as being really traumatised with my adopted parents 
trying to turn me into what they thought I should be. So it was a fight. And one of the traumas was that, you know, I sort of can still see that now is I would have been maybe four and uh, I was taken by the orphanage and it was a big red brick building with white sort of mortar, you know, like and, and barbed wire on the fences and it was... Like a prison. It was a prison, man. It was a prison and, and I didn't even know what a prison was then. No. But all of that stuff, when I, un, when I unraveled it in front of her, it was... That in itself was a trauma because I hadn't thought of that stuff sure. in a long time. So when you bring all this st- stuff up, it takes quite a while to deal with. You know, it takes professional help. I've got friends around me, uh, you know, my manager here, Carlitos. I mean, he's a psychologist. Uh, his wife's a psychiatrist. i got really good people around that can steer me in that, you know. But I do take medicine. I have a pretty strong chemical imbalance. I came, I had a psychotic episode over Easter where I forgot to take it for six days. It was horrific. Really? It was horrific. Wow. The voices that day, and there was a, there was Nick Carroll witnessed it, and another friend of mine just got in there in time. Yeah. Wow. And it was just like, whoa. And, and it's like all of a sudden... I get really this energy and it feels like this amazing creative energy, but I'm on edge and I'm really happy. And then it just takes one trigger and bang, all of a sudden, you know, I'm, I'm looking in, at the black hole. I'm looking at the edge. I'm at the precipice, literally. And that usually manifests as anger or rage or just depression, just sadness. Anger. Anger with anger against myself and incredible sadness, incredible okay. sadness okay. that this is what you are. And that's where, and I might as well bring it forward now, Sonny and I have talked about this. And Sonny came here a couple of years ago and got some boards. And I've known Sonny since he was a kid. And uh, we have exactly the same. Uh, when I found out what had happened, you know, and I'm not going to go into any details. I've got too too much respect. It's always possible as a miracle, but I know exactly what he went through. Yeah, no one there for that that psychotic moment where he just said, "I he can't handle himself." You feel like you're doing the world a favour by checking out. Really? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. So what? It's not about it's it, it's it's Sunny and I have the same thing because we've always sort of you know and I've been like uncle to him and um, you know going back instances with Dane Kaloa, Kaloa <laughs> cracked him once <laughs> in, at Huntington and Sunny was a kid and it was Sunny's hero and it, it, it long long story short in the end I'd go to Dane and go what'd you do that for and then he'd go well he pull my leash and I go back to Sonny and Sonny you go what'd you pull his leash for and then go back and then and then Dana said well, well he shouldn't have been so close to being near my leash and Sonny's gone man I don't know so I actually uh, I actually uh, invited Dane for breakfast one morning at, at D'Amico's and I invited Sonny <laughs> and they both saw each other and I said you two fucking sit down will you you know, and I just sat them down and I just said, well, fuck you two. You're fucking Hawaiians. You're brothers. Yeah. You're both the fucking same. This is a younger version, for fuck's sake. Man, in the end, and I said something pretty funny at the time. I said, if you guys, if you fucking two Hawaiians can't get, I'll bash fucking both your heads together. You know, and I sort of made the move to just grab them both by the back of the head and they burst out laughing. Yeah. Yeah, good. And 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 that that's a moment. That's how long I go back with Sonny. So, Sonny and I opened up we, when he came here a couple of years ago, and just ordered some guns, and he just wanted to sit and talk. And we've talked on the phone. I've talked in a way to him, but this one was, it's like, what do you got? What do you got? And we started digging down. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, yeah. We analysed each other, and he was starting to go through, you know, um, he was starting to go to some of the clinics and stuff. Okay. 
And he was dealing, what he was dealing with was exactly the same thing as me, except, you know, mine is a lot older than that. I don't know the specifics, like I'm able to tell you now that I can go back to jail and that, that was like a turbo, turbo boost onto what I already had as a, a pre-five-year-old, you know, and plus what I went through at school and everything else, all the other shit. But that, when I've actually boiled those points down, yeah. Is there is there anything that anybody can do in your support system or the people around you to prevent terrible things from happening. I'll tell you what, the last thing you do is feed. Feed, you're a legend, you're strong. Really? All of that. Okay. That is, it's nearly counterproductive because that's the stuff we're running away. I just want to be normal. I want to be a fucking person. I just, I don't want to be, legends are dead. You know, a real legend, it just all of these terms get thrown round just so loosely and you, you don't realize i mean i've only made one little comment about sunny i've got some photos i've got some stuff like that but it's not about that it, it's what i saying you're strong hey sunny I, I understand people's best wishes but for fuck's sake educate yourself on you know be there if you've got to ask someone are you okay because you feel like they're a bit down or something and they go yeah don't accept it. We'll fucking lie and bullshit to you. You know, be there. Just make sure you, you, you put your guard up. Maybe stay a distance. Maybe make a call every now and then. Maybe drop round and, and knock and how you doing? And, and, and you know, d- don't tell someone. Don't feed the bullshit. Don't feed the, uh, don't the feed the ego. Don't feel the facade. Feed the facade. Facade. Sorry about that. How do you how do you feel about um, seeing all the Instagram posts of people in support of Sunny outwardly, but also to me a lot of it just feels like they are virtue signaling. Like, hey, yeah, I have one photo of Sunny. Now's a good time to post it, so I'm going to post it and write something nice to Sunny. Is it positive? What are your thoughts? You just wouldn't read them. If, okay. If if. You know, and we pray that Sonny comes out of it. But the amount of people that I see pray for Sonny, I mean, do you really believe in God? Are you just, is that a throwaway line? I don't know. I've seen some posts from people who I know are atheists and that, and they're all praying for Sonny and they're saying, saying stuff like that. Do they actually know what that means? I mean, Sonny, Sonny, Sonny's a born-again Christian. He's, for, he's fighting for his life against, you know, we like to think as those dark little voices as as the enemy, as Satan, you know? And it makes it a lot easier to deal with that you're under attack by a dark force. And it's not just you. There is light. There, there is a really good side to us. You know, anyone and everybody who know, really knows Sonny knows he's got a fucking heart as big as, big as Texas. He's got a heart of gold, mate. Yeah. But there's been episodes where, and I've got exactly the same, there's episodes where I've hurt people and, you know, it's like that story I was telling you. I got out of jail and, you know, I'm sitting in a bar. I just told what this one the other day. I feel really bad about this still. I don't even know who it was. And he's looking at me at the bar. And I realise now he's going, oh, I think that's uh, Maurice Cole. I think that's Morris Cole. Wow, he's looking pretty good. And I'm looking at him and go, what are you fucking looking at? And he goes, nothing. And I thought he called me nothing. And I just fucking ricked over and I cracked him one, not once or twice. But I could have fucking killed that guy. When in actual fact, he was just trying to say, hey, I'm just sort of minding my own business. He but was starstruck. Yeah. And, and, you know, that one sticks with me, you know, and you, you often say you have regrets and it's, yeah, I do have regrets. I used to think I, the only regret I ever had was when my so- wife sold, I had this E335 1964 Gibson fucking guitar that was just, yeah. But there are sort of regrets in that, Maybe I should have come forward sooner and started trying to help other people, you know, helping myself, you know, and also people that have reached out and gone, fuck, thank you. And I know it's heartfelt. And that Sonny would be able to look at all these Instagrams and that and go, wow. But the most horrible thing would be is for one of us in our positions is to read some of that stuff. And know that it was just superficial. Right. That's what I that's mm. what I worry about too as I go through it. Because I know 
I've gone off Instagram. Like, Have you? I've tried to go back on and do business. Well, I've got all this new, all this new incredible stuff happening, and amazing news, and you know, yeah, and I've I, just yeah. I so I have new optimism in the internet um, based on your podcast that we published to see the outpouring of sincere heartfelt earnest support for you i did not anticipate because the internet is generally veers towards um the most sensational thing you could possibly say and a lot of negativity of course and a lot of critical you know just being critical of people so i presumed that's what the response would be and to see the exact opposite almost revitalized my faith in humanity it was like oh my gosh yeah vulnerability from you ended up cultivating meaningful connection you know well and and that's it's it's not a just sometimes you know you've got to do something and it's it's partly for yourself but it's you know i've always done that for other people you know and that's one of my my wife's criticism that she always thinks that i gave more to other people than back to the family Mm. so you sort of do you take for granted that you know your wife or your family or you know and then probably went surfing and should have been somewhere else doing something with the kids or something, blah, blah, blah. But it is what it is. And I look at both my kids now and I couldn't be more proud of, of where, they are, where they are, what they're doing. They've gone through some hard times, rough times. They're still going through it now with us. But it's when you say me, it's we. We. It's not just me who's got depression and PTSD and who's got issues. Man, it's... It's like a fucking epidemic out yeah, there. I agree. You talk about youth suicides. Some of the shit I've had to deal with since I've been on this trip here with people with cancer, people down, people out, people fucking overdosing. I mean, there's been some pretty horrific days since I've been here because I realised I've finally got myself settled at home, but I travel everywhere. So I come across another whole... Uh, a group of people here with with great energy you know like great energy going up and surfing point doom and uh, malibu the other day and that's a really high day the next day there was some shit happened i'll tell you after i, I don't think i can say that sure. on here and it just wrecked us you know and i had someone you know someone in tears just a very very someone we know and because of what's happened in the family and so, you know, you absorb that and you absorb more and more. And then I go home and I've got more at home. Hey, if there's anyone in France that needs a help, hopefully you can't speak English and you're not listening to this. <laughs> but, you know, I'll be going to France in, in about three weeks. So, you know, and there's dear to your friends there. And so, you know, even when I go to Japan, places that are my second homes. And so it's, it sometimes feels like, you know, it, it, on bad days, it feels like I'm carrying just this one ton, 10 ton load. And then, you know, I've got to go home and just, just go to sleep. And sometimes I have to take a sleeping pill and just to yeah. get through. Uh, yeah. But I think that the what is so counterintuitive is that it sounds like it would be a huge emotional burden to hear all those other people's grief and to be a support system. But the way that you're wording it, seems to indicate that it actually fuels you that it isn't a burden for you that it, act, it, it that when you're alone by yourself that's the burden yeah but when you connect with other humans yeah. and lighten their load it actually lightens your load as well well you can help them process it you can help them i mean it's the whole thing about giving feels a lot better than taking you know i mean which that's, is counterintuitive that's just, exactly so you, you are you the problem or are you part of the solution? And because I have the knowledge and experiences, I find myself counselling people a lot, you know. But and you that do. lightens your load too. Oh, that lightens the load, yeah. So I, um, go ahead. Can I have a sip of your coffee or something? Yeah, yeah you can have the rest of it. It's cold though. It doesn't matter. I just need, I think of a mouth starting to stick together. You uh, can finish perfect. it. Perfect. And black. Oh, have you got a heat of vodka in there? <laughs> You're kidding me? It's whiskey. Huh? It's whiskey. whiskey. Come on, man. I can taste whiskey. Um, so when I hear those, when you and I had that conversation previously, it reminds me that I need to be more aware of what people in my life are going through. Like, because 
I, you know, I get through every day pretty easily and kind of superficially a lot of the times. And I have these peripheral relationships that I maybe don't invest in as much as I can. And I have conversations like that. And it reminds me like, oh, shoot, I should check in with so-and-so. Um, I could say this because this person won't listen to the podcast and they're not connected to the surf world at all. But a friend who's in recovery for alcoholism. And I got off. He called me on Tuesday. I haven't spoken with him in six months called me on Tuesday to reveal that he had a pretty significant relapse over the holidays and like spent a week living out of his car and wife is still there for him, but really was on the verge of kind of abandoning and or leaving. And I felt so terrible after getting off the phone because I had not reached out to him for six months. I've thought of him during that six months. And my thought was, eh, I'm too busy right now. The holidays are here. Like I'll check in with him later. But also knowing if he wasn't checking in with me during the six months, it's probably not a good indicator. So I'm thrilled he's now back kind of in recovery and currently on the straight and narrow, but I feel guilty that I didn't check in. Well, luckily he made it. So now you know this person, okay? He reached out to you. Yes. So that's, now I feel a certain responsibility. Well, you, you do have a responsibility, you know, and as a friend. Exactly. As a friend. He's actually gone through six months of probably hell by himself. Totally. Lost he his job. Lost his job. Wonder he didn't lose his wife. Yep. I mean, that's part of the reason I think I've lost my wife. You know, I hope not for good, but, you know, there's there's another big story coming up there, it looks like. I'll, I'll get onto that in a minute. There's, oh, no, I might as well say it now. My mother's Day just went by. Uh, it was, and the, the trouble, trouble is, when I'm over here, Mother's Day in Australia was on Saturday, and it was Mother's Day here on Sunday. So you're <laughs> so, a day behind. No, so I got to live Mother's Day twice. Oh, gotcha. <laughs> but I had something pretty amazing on Saturday because part of this being an adopted kid is a lot of people have to really understand that being adopted is has it comes with a whole different set of emotions yeah i think that's the best way to put it emotions in that you do feel you do you do feel naturally alone especially if you've been told from a very young age that you were adopted because there used to be a real stigma to that that your parents didn't want you and they gave you away that was that's a stigma that you 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 used it's embedded to, you, in your dna well you're in bed rejection yeah. rejection i hate being rejected and i know why i hate being rejected because i was rejected by my mother and then I finally met my mother, you know, and that was, uh, I don't even know if I want to say this. I thought this would be a great, one of the greatest things of all time. But then she started telling me about her sisters and she, she was the 11th child. And then one of her sisters, <sighs> one of her sisters actually married a pedophile and bred kids for the pedophile. I mean, this is fucking real life shit, you know. And they're all dead now because they all suicided. Mm. And you go, well, that's a really nice... <laughs> Do I really want to know my family history? So I did ask my mother at the time, what about my father? And she just looked at, hung her head and just said, I can't remember, I can't remember, I can't remember. And I knew, no, I'm pretty sure she could remember. And then, you, then your mind takes you through the scenario. Wow, was she raped? Could she have been pack raped? Because she's a dark little kid living in a white society in the western district of western Victoria, which is redneck land. It's like living in, fuck, I don't know. And being the only dark kid up there except for the Aboriginal, she's quite a small lady. So she went through hell. She got pregnant with me when she was 17. So there was no hope of ever finding out the father. And uh, on Saturday, uh, my daughter has been in contact. She's been doing this DNA thing. And the guy's got hold of her in his 40s, yeah? And it looks like we found my father. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and he's 86 years of age, married, living in, living in um, Sydney. And it's like, it's like after this week, and then I'm processing that as a positive, yeah, you, you go, God, that's going to be insane. I might actually get to meet my father. But then there's the other dark voice that says, well... Maybe he raped your mother. Maybe he did this. Maybe he did that. I mean, why hasn't he done it? And there's all this shit just depending on where I'm at at the time. And, you know, cause, right. and I've got Mother's Day happening and I'm 
calling home and I'm, it was also my wife's birthday on that day too, which is, you know, which I didn't give it, get to give her a hug. That's the first time, you know. I mean, I've been with her since I was 18 years of age. So I've never lived by myself since I was 18. I'm back out. And I don't even know how to make the bed. No, I'm only kidding. <laughs> so you just found that out on Saturday. I found that out on Saturday. So wow. this weekend has been like a, yeah. What do you? Uh, I've been did, flat. I've been up. I was just, I was euphoric for a couple of hours. And then just with everything else, there's just, you know, well, I wish I was, I wish I was at home. I should have been anyhow. Shoulda, coulda, woulda. But, you know, here I am uh, Monday morning talking to you about a pretty bumpy weekend. Yeah, pretty so bumpy. Did your daughter or you reach out to him yet? Does he she, know? They are contacting. I haven't. We haven't put it forward yet. Um, uh, I haven't. I haven't done anything. I'm letting her deal with it. Okay. Um, depending on the moment, because I'm still trying to, you know, get home. I've got a good news. I've got my factory back. I'm making surfboards in Australia. I'm making the best fucking surfboards I've make and made in five years. I've got a good little team. We've got a, this good little tight thing. I, all of a sudden, the rebuilding of the business and, you know, you've got to face it, the business is me shaping and creating and, fuck, that's what I love doing. And when I haven't had, the, had that, it's, you know, I feel a little bit lost out there. Really? Uh, oh, yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> I've often thought, fuck this, I've got to get out of surfing. I've got to stop surfing. It's become so mediocre that the bullshit that's finally permeated surfing has finally caught up. It's like a disease, an epidemic that's gone through the whole industry. I think I need to retire. And then you you go through that whole process and you go, fuck, I can't do anything else. I'm unemployable. <laughs> <laughs> fuck. Okay, I've gone, I look at those people, I go, I'll do the stop and go signs. And I go, well, fuck, you're 65 years yeah, of age. Yeah, you're, yeah. you're retired. Then no one's going to give you a job. No, but you know what? I think um, if you're always trying to grow your business, then you do have to consider a lot of the politics and whatever else. But if you just kind of focus on a small business, building boards for yeah. people you know on a first name basis, yep. maybe 300 boards a year in each location or yep. whatever the number is, That's then you can ignore trends. You can ignore whatever the WSL is doing. You could ignore yeah. marketing. You could ignore all of it and just maintenance. Well, that's that's and charge appropriate. Well, that's basically what I'm doing. But you know, it's it's it always because the WSL, the ASP, has always been part of my DNA. Um, I like looking at it. It's just it's got really it's quite boring for me because they're all riding the same boards. I could I could take you down the shop and show you the bottom lines they're riding now are about 28 years old. You know, it's like it's sort of like having the same chassis, it's the same chassis and motor and suspension in a motor car that's been there for 30 years like the same old stuff but you've got new electric windows you've got a bluetooth you've got and you keep adding these bells and whistles and bells and whistles so in my world which i like designing and people coming to me you know like ross originally said i need a one i need a five nine that'll work in eight to eighty feet you know give me a brief give me something you know like I get people come to me and go, oh, yeah, you know, I'm getting older and I need this and this and this. Can you make me something that's a little bit more high performance? And yeah, that sort of the designing side to me is is really, there's always a frontier. Okay. There's there's no such thing as, uh, there's no such thing as, uh, oh, yeah, I've reached my peak design. I've seen a few shapers go, I don't think it'll go any further. I mean, I look at that and go ludicrous, and I go, "If we thought, if if I thought like that, or the humans thought like that, we'd be still trying to roll around a some big stone and as shaped as a wheel, right? You know, like yeah, and and so so my whole thing is, you know, and I've just been spent a little bit of time with Ryan Birch and uh, Sharma Buttonshaw and some of the younger shapers, and I yeah. can see what they what they're doing. A lot of people go, "Oh, they're doing that hipster shit." It's not. It's just the mainstream stuff that, that goes on with the so-called performance high shortboard, which, yeah. which is being used in competition. They have no interest in doing that. There's no career path to do that. Really? Yeah. Over on the other side, they're learning to ride longboards, shortboards, asymmetrics, different fins, twin keels. They're, they're experiencing all of these feelings that none of the pe the current people uh, the current stable of shapers, got to be careful here, 
that uh, shaping boards on the CT tour would know that stuff, unless they were older and they're not. How do they know how a long board goes? How do they know how a real twin fin feels? I mean, these kids are out there pushing that shit yeah. and adapting and taking pieces here and there, you know, like, God, I spent... Well, uh, I think what's interesting, you're making a really interesting point, and it's high-performance pointy short boards have become a commodity in the marketplace to where if you're going to get into the business, unless you're making thousands of those a year, yeah. you can't really make a living. Yeah. First of all, you can't compete with those guys. Nope. Then there's backyard guys on Craigslist who are trying to do it. They're just trying to replicate one that they bought off the rack or whatever, and they're willing to sell it for 350 bucks on Craigslist. So there isn't a career path for guys like Ryan or Shima. And they're almost forced to then do these kind of one-off handcrafted things. And I think that's been really, really good for surfing as a whole and for board building as a whole. Because now they're actually very focused on hydrodynamics and board yeah. design and what works and why it works. It's almost like a resetting of the learning curve. And they've shaped them all off the blanks. Right. And they finally realized that pre-shapes are unbelievably good. They both... And love using pre-shapes because they're not getting sore arms. That means they can surf longer, surf more, and they have their own. They're putting their own, they're logging in their own stuff. It's just a tool. It's just a tool. So wait, those guys are using pre-shapes? Is that what you're saying? Fuck yeah, yeah. Okay. The ones that aren't using pre-shapes either haven't got enough work, or they're sort of trying to propagate some myth that hand shaping has this intrinsic quality that pre-shapes don't. And there's two types of pre-shape. There's the pre-shape you do that you do as a stock board where you can finish in 10 minutes. And it's like the other day I, I, I did, a, uh, I did a, a reverse V. I wanted to change it. And uh, this young kid, Brandon, came in and watched me. And it took me a, one hour and 43 minutes to reshape the pre-shape to get what I wanted. And okay. then the next day, Timmy comes in and we take the specs and what I've done by eye. I don't know how. I don't know how to, to log on. I don't know even know how to design on a computer. Got it. I've got really good people, much better than me, that do that work. And then I go in and whittle away. You know, I whittle away. And uh, I've still got really, really gut feel on curves. And it's Eric Arakawa who told me, you know, a few years ago, we did a gun. And he said, it's perfect. It came off the machine. I said, are you kidding? Look at this. Look at this. And uh, anyhow... So uh, I just he just went, what do you mean? And I said, come back in an hour. And then I get my block and I whittle away and I clean it up. And he comes back and sees it in an hour and goes, oh, my God, that's so much better to his eye. And then he just sort of looked at me and went, wow, I think I've lost my gut feel. <laughs> so Eric shapes quite a few boards off the blank now and gets in there and gets the feel and trying to get that thing that we all know. Right. I can tell. I can tell when something special happens, yeah. you know, and because I'm not a very good craftsman, like people say, why don't you do the boardroom show? And I said, if you saw me in there with my old Makita, I am the worst craftsman. I would be in the bottom 10%. But if you get me in there <laughs> with a, just a basic pre-shape and let me have a couple of tools, I mean, if they ever have a, a shape off with a surf form and a block, Man, am I ready? <laughs> <laughs> but what it what it what it shows is is that like Ryan and those guys now, I mean, they still shape off the blank, but it's the learning process. It's the being able to visualize and conceptualize what's in the blank. Yeah. So you're actually seeing curves. We like I close my eyes when I do that. But you'll actually see sometimes and you'll pick up something and there's mistakes that come off the machine. There's there's something you don't like about that pre-shape. So then you work out what is it. And even knowing, trying to just define what is that problem or what is that thing you don't like and go, oh yeah, if I take that out and I do this and that. But we have to make a certain amount of money, right? Um, <laughs> just to survive, yeah. to pay for the boards for ourselves. And to the people who say, years and years ago, Rusty, when I was working at Rusty in the early 90s, Hang on. 
people yeah. who listen will think their phone's pinging. Yeah, they're pinging. Everyone will be, yeah. be anyhow. So when I was at Rusty's in early '91, when I did all the reverse V's and they all came off pre shapes, and it was a happy mistake because the reverse V's, the pre shapes in the container bent, right. an extra three quarters of an inch in the nose and tail. And I've still got the original down there. Anyhow, so so. I actually got to Rusty's and Becker ran this big ad about that he's the machine, you don't need machines, and he apparently is incredible with a sander. He can shape a whole board with a sander. He's really? really quick. Yeah, yeah, really quick. And Rusty went, you know, what the fuck do we do about this? And I said, so I came up with this advertising campaign, okay? And the advertising campaign was really simple. It's a photo of Rusty and I standing in the Amazon, yeah, looking at this big balsa tree, and we've got a beaver in our hands yeah and down the bottom it's the caption is no tools and i said that the other night i had a pretty big night out with ryan and all the boys all the boys down at encinitas there where they stay in the derby house and i sort of started started telling that story and then they sort of i think it was sharma might have said it or ryan sort of said fuck that'd be like we could do the same thing, except you can have the beaver, and because we're just the young apprentices, we have woodpeckers. <laughs> do you know what I mean? So the whole thing about no tools is just stupid. So it's just it's just not real. It's just yeah. someone marketing marketing. But if they're going to try and have a crack at us, yeah, about going, we got no soul. Yeah. Well, I'll turn around to those guys and go, well, are you paying your royalties? Because what you're shaping off the blank is just plagiarism. How about just paying a bit of respect to where you're getting all, got those designs from? And because right. hand shaping so innovative and creative, well, show me what you've done. Yeah. Show me what's real. And don't just show me some bells and whistles and six wings and 15 bottom channels and something. Show me something that goes better than any current boards. Yeah. And that's totally. what being a designer is. Yeah. Um, we had a couple of things on our agenda to talk about sustainability kind of the conversation of sustainability and surfboards if you still want to do that and then talking about Stop bells cringing <laughs> <laughs> i mean there's a lot of different angles but i mean what you're talking about with that becker ad is kind of a um obfuscation from a shaper saying like oh this thing is bad and they're kind of just redirecting it's a lot of smoke and mirrors Ugh. and the sustainability conversation i think you and i have talked off air that nobody has really done real longitudinal studies to fully understand what our carbon footprint is, what a certain type of manufacturing's carbon footprint is versus another. So it's almost um, disingenuous to put your hand up and say, definably, this is less impact than that thing is because nobody's really fully studied it. Am I right? Well, yeah, you are, you, you, you're touching on your, it's the tip of the iceberg. And I think what we talked about before, Nick Carroll was just over here and wrote an article um, in Coastal Watch, I think, yeah. uh, uh, about sustainable surfboards because he went to the boardroom show and he's interviewed a lot of people. And just so you know, you, Nick and I speak a lot. So he's a, he can be a journalist. He can be one of the best board testers in the world. And he's also a very, very, very close friend. Okay, so... We were able, but he's able to differentiate those. And this one, he was a clinical journalist looking at what sustainability is because it's a really, really big question right now on what's being sold as sustainable. That's it. That's what's what I'm being to marketed say. as sustainable. And so it's really interesting. So Nick's just written this article and just really, really simply said, well, the most sustainable surfboards made out of wood. And there's some people out there doing amazing boards out of wood. They're, you know, putting hollow wood boards. They're just like, but they're not high performance. They're beautiful pieces. You could probably get a little bit of performance, but not to where we could surf them in our everyday lives, you know, and perform at the same level at what we're performing now. Or you'd never see a CT surfer riding no, one of those you boards. Never get and, it. and anyone that's, uh, you know, they're, they're very, very limited performance-wise, a wooden surfboard, let alone how the hell would we make a million a year or whatever it is, whatever the world market is. But so, okay. And they're expensive. And they're really expensive, you know, they're all handmade, really expensive. So the minute you cross that line, if that's sustainable, we cross a line and we go into plastic surfboards. It doesn't matter whether it's PU, whether it's EPS, whether it's bio epoxy, it doesn't matter whether it's polyester, 
all the composites, everything. It's plastic. Right. So we live in the plastics. Now, I personally have looked at this for a long, long time, making EPS epoxy boards. I've gone back and checked. It was 86 to 91. I probably did about 3,000 in France. Um, EPS, I used to cut all my EPS uh, myself. I used to do all the hot wiring. I'd, I'd glue the stringers. Wow. Um, I did stringerless. Uh, I did stringless sailboards. I made. I did vacuum bagging. Uh, in the 80s, I'd, uh, for the um, for the slalom boards, because at one stage here, I was really well known in because um, I got really good money. Imagine getting $500 a shape for a sailboard in 1986 as many as you could do, and all you had to really do was cl- cut the plan shape out, and the Clark blanks were that good, you just rolled the rails. Crazy. They were e- qu- easier and quicker than a surfboard. Crazy. <laughs> so, you know, so going through all of that and having a look at which boards lasted, you know, and I cannot find one of those boards anywhere. However, the twin fins and stuff that I made in the early 80s out of the, the some of the PU, the Barlon PU, and polyesters, I've still there's they're still around, and I go go and look at what boards have lasted longest. And I've always used really thick stringers because I used to use them for myself. Because m- breaking a board was heartbreaking, especially if it was a magic board. Yeah. So I've always, and people have always, Pat Rawson used to joke about it in Hawaii in the eighties and nineties that you know, I was deforesting the the planet by using so much wood. That's uh, funny. Yeah, it was. It was Pat saying, "Fuck, man, you use really thick stringers." But they're all they're still there, you know. Marvin's yeah, quivers still alive. Dane's boards, you know, like they're all still there. So. The minute we co- cross into plastic surfboards, it's become really, really simple because this is something, if we're going to criticise something and I see something that's not unsustainable and that they're breaking a lot and it's been marketed as, as sustainable or whatever you want to call them, yeah, and they're breaking and they're, they're expensive and they're really hard to fix. So really simply, a sustainable surfboard, if you had to travel for three years with a surfboard on a trip and you could have one surfboard what would you make it out of i would make it um that's a rhetorical question (laughs) um i would make it out of it i would use a u.s blank because i think they have the highest moral integrity of any blank maker in the world they comply to ep ep epa standards in california which are really tough like-minded like-minded people who have got solar solar i've been right up through the factory they've got solar panels they're powering the whole factory with solar the filtrage system is second to none um the new blanks are just incredible so there's my first thing i'll use an apple core stringer because they're the strongest lightest wooden stringer sustainable timber whatever that you know and he goes to plantations and that the old brad applegate um, so we've got this five ply three sixteen stringer that is just incredible. That seems to hold up really well. And then I would do it in an epoxy, probably a bio epoxy, because that the epoxy is a little bit stronger, it lasts longer, but it's much nicer to work with from a fume point of view. Okay. So that's my basic board, travel board. That's the most sustainable surfboard that I know of. Unless you could go one step further and go to someone like Varial Glassing and get it vacuum bagged or infused top and bottom. And we've now got a board that will last a long, long time. And it's not an arm and a leg. Okay. But all the, the stringless EPS, all of this sort of stuff that's out on the market is to me... It's just cheap junk. But the one thing you're telling doesn't account for is the EPS is recyclable. So even if the EPS breaks earlier, you can recycle EPS foam. Yeah. What do you think happens? How many people take back their broken EPS board to a recycle place? Where do you recycle them? How do you recycle them? Those are good questions that deserve just, answers. Yeah. Oh, there's answers. But, you know, it's it's like when you find out now with EPS, it's slowly but surely being banned. The fumes of burning EPS will kill you. You know that? No. Yeah, I've, I'll show you a little bit of data later. It's one of the most toxic. When, when that stuff burns 
I mean, you could probably you wouldn't last probably forty five seconds, and it'll drop you. Yeah, it's that fucking toxic. It's going into landfills. Um, is it toxic for humans to breathe like directly or toxic for the environment for it going out into the ether? If, it, if, it, if it's if it's burning it's it's a it's a horror show okay. uh, I'll show you some stats later I've got but it recycling it is so it rec- burning it but so recycling it if you're recycling something that breaks t- every year twice a year three times a year people are breaking boards in really small no one's recycling that stuff. They're buying another one. So what's your carbon footprint if you've got to get three, replace three boards a year or, or the life of that surfboard is so minimal and, and in 20 years, how many of those do you break? What is the footprint compared to one board that was manufactured at a higher price and it was it yeah. was vacuum bagged? It was uh, Well, even the process of recycling requires energy expenditure. Yeah. You know, so oh, then yeah. that you got to factor that into the carbon footprint as well. Yeah, yeah, but there's there's no it, it's like I don't know. I think it's the same for you here in the USA. China stopped accepting our recyclable stuff. No, I don't. But I don't know about that. You go and have a look at this. There'll be a big percentage of America's recyclable stuff goes and gets recycled in China. We had it in Australia, thirty percent. We think it's more now. 30% is the official figure of recyclable rubbish that was sent to China. Now they've knocked it back. Now we have a crisis in Australia and they don't know what to do with it. So guess what they're doing with all the recyclables? Putting it in landfill. Mm. Everywhere. There's, there's, this, is, this is another big, what I think we're at the tip of the iceberg is, is that this whole recycle, we believe that we're recycling stuff. But are we really sure where it goes? Do we as humans really understand where it's going? Do they burn it? Do they do they mash it back up? Or do they just charge you for recycling like they've done in Melbourne, Australia? They've found 13 different recyclable toxic, like toxic recyclables supposedly, you know, like EPS or whatever. Yeah. And guess what? They just fill the factories up and leave them. Hmm. So all of a sudden, we've been getting a series of fires in Melbourne where the whole city is under a black cloud and all the rivers have got all this shit going down them because somebody uh, rented a big warehouse, took the money, and then bolted. (laughs) Do you follow what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So that's something. When we talk about it, what makes us feel good, we're recycling. But where does it go, really? Right. And everything I've looked at so far, it's like Pandora's box. Yeah. Yeah, I know. The more you kind of unpack it, the more complicated it seems to be. Yeah. Like, obviously, I feel like everybody has the best intentions, but I'm kind of apprehensive to talk about, quote, sustainability on the podcast um, just because I do feel overwhelmed by the amount of information and I don't want to misspeak and advocate for something now that five years down the road or five months down the road, I recognize like those things weren't really what they seem to be, you know? Um, But but the the point is that you're making is right. Don't break the surfboard. Ride the surfboard for 30 years. Look, don't break the surfboard. Look, just repairing stuff. How do you repair things? You know, like that's part of the sustainable product to keep the board going. Yeah. Like eventually you hope you see some young kid running down the beach with a yellow board under his arm. Well, you know, the, the, I think it's the, the Gadowskis who just went around and collected all those great surfboards, yeah, and shipped them to South Africa. Right. You know, so to me, those surfboards, they've been around for 10, 20 years, maybe 30 years, but kids are actually using them. Yep. And they don't take on water. They don't get heavy. You know, it's just, it's just cheap crap. Yeah. So you look at a company who's bastardized the manufacturing process um, down to where it's really weak, where the boards are really weak, where they break just so easily, very hard to repair. And then you speak to some of the retailers around the world, and if they break, someone breaks a board, and they've only you replace it, or if they they're not happy with the board, you replace it with a board, and then just cut it in half and throw it in the in the dumpster. Mm. I mean, that's we're talking policy here. I yeah. mean, I've got stuff that this at a, at a later stage when we know a little bit more, David. I think 
this should be brought out. We should have a roundtable discussion with some of these people if they'd be up for it. Yeah, it'd be. And, and, dis- and discuss. It'd be worth discussing. Yeah, it is worth discussing because it, it's sort of heartbreaking for me to see what the industry's become from what it became. You know, and now is it, is it really all about the money? Is it all about, you know, what are the business principles? We've seen the devastation in the in the surf market by sale or return or consignment with the clothing companies, because no matter what, after the summer when you have to give your product back, yeah, your your premium product back, whether it be a Quicksilver or a Billabong, at that time, where do you think that goes from there? It goes to Costco. It goes to all those cheap places. So all of a sudden, you, you could get a pair of Quicksilver shorts and a pair of Billabong shorts for ten dollars new, sort of last year's models, but they all sort of look the same unless you're really following fashion. So the same things happen in surfboards, where the big companies have come in, yeah, and they've absolutely knocked out all the the smaller guys by doing consignment, you know, and consignment is an immoral business practice end of quote, Patagonia. And we all know that, and it's had a devastating effect on the industry. In fact, it's probably the most devastating thing on the industry, and I'll get back to that point with Ryan and that before. Before, it was really simple. You actually came through as a shaper. If you were lucky, you could go shape for someone and learn, and that person would teach you to shape off the blank. You'd learn the glass and sand, so you knew how to make a surfboard. Then you get a, a pretty good kid on your boards, and then you you make a you make a very good high performance surfboard, and there was a career path. There was a career path. That career path has been stopped dead now, from the high performance point of view, and that's why I think the, the current performance is on the WSL. I watched Oki at Bells. You know, you just saw the heat, but I saw him free surfing, and people were blown out. He still got the best bottom turn vertical off the lip just like Italo just like Medina you know and just like Caroline Marks just like Caroline (laughs) Marks yeah true she she's a mini oc she's a mini oc so so you look at it and you go wow wow so where is the performance coming why aren't the guys going faster okay everyone can do airs the the biggest improvement to me in the pro surfing has been backside tube riding interesting oh it doesn't matter whether it's left or right now, mate. If you, every guy, those top guys, they can surf. You know, that's been the really, really yeah, big improvement point. for me, yeah. you know. However, having said that, there's also been something else that's happened at Bells this year. Are we getting on to this yeah, now? Yeah, please. Yeah. Is that guys actually rocked up the Bells knowing damn well there was a really big swell coming, you know. And what you saw was part of, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> part of the swell what you didn't see was and i sat there all afternoon waiting for it when you watch bells on that big friday and a bit junky in that we missed the swell the swell came that night and there was another three or four foot in it the buoys jumped from 15.6 seconds to 18.2 and they went from 24 feet to 32 feet overnight and it was really really big wow. and they got caught with their pants down yeah you know, there were people flying in boards, but we could see a week, a week out, 10 days before, we could see that there was something massive looming at the end of the period. And to, to know that Bells, when it's up around those seconds, it's a really strong wave. Everyone says, oh, yeah, it's big and flat and that. You go out there and you'll get your ass kicked. Yeah. You'll get buried there. You'll get, you'll get dragged 50 metres underwater. Right. You'll end up on the button. I mean, Italo's lucky to be alive. So is John John. That button, my best friend died on that button, and he really? was the best, John Pawson, he was the best waterman out of all of us. Just bumped his head, and that was it. So you look at all these, and I, I sort of went, yeah, I, I love going back to racing car driving. It's like going to a, uh, being a professional race car driver, and you see that the next tournament or the next race, it's going to be wet, and you go, ah, fuck it, I'll just take the slicks anyway. And you didn't take your wet weather tyres. What are you doing the whole time in in rain on slicks? You're actually nursing it and sliding everywhere all over the place. And that's what I saw on that Friday. I've never seen people so unprepared. People were flying boards in from California. There were guys flying around. But like I said to to Tony and Seth Moniz, 
they're going, what do you think? What do you think? And they came out to the factory and I was, had a really good talk showing him boards. And I said, what board would you surf at Sunset Beach at 8 to 10 feet with 12 foot sets, but with a strong northwest wind? They went, oh, 7-2 or a 6-8. And that was my answer. So, so what was, who's to blame? I want to point the finger I, and make and shame somebody, but it's like everybody made the mistake. There were very few people who were actually prepared. Yeah. I don't know. What, it's what a, shocking. What do coaches do? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I would think. <laughs> you would think yeah. that a, the coaches would be all over. But you were on the site. I mean, what but was Are this? people asking me, have you got long boards? Have you got... And I go, no, I don't. Not, not professional boards. I've got they bigger had, boards. People had five days, let's say, right, to actually prepare. Yeah, but it's it, the, the swells we can see. We knew from when the contest started on the Wednesday that in 10 days, like nine or eight days, there was something massive looming. The beautiful thing is now we've got pretty accurate weather reports. And we were looking at that one, and it's still a long way away, but it's like how hard is it to throw a bigger board in your quiver? You rock up with 10 five elevens yeah. and maybe a 6-2 step up, and, you know, a couple of step-ups, I think um, I think Philippe Toledo, he broke most of his step-ups. Okay. And he was hanging on. He was I call him a Klingon. He was <laughs> hanging on for dear life in yeah. every turn, nursing every turn. Uh, what, do you, what are your thoughts on John John riding the same 6-2 kind of throughout? Once he's up and riding on a wave, it looked amazing. The board looked fine. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Because that's his step-up board, isn't he? And that's sort of the similar sort of board that he rode at Margaret River. Right. So he's used to those conditions. It's just making sure that he catches the waves. Which he was And that's the problem was, if the swell had a hit that afternoon, it could have been five foot bigger. Yeah. So I would have said it was 10 foot. There are a couple of really big sets on the high tide. If it had been low tide, it would have been breaking at least another 100 metres further out from where they were catching it. And it's as big as a football stadium, the yeah. takeoff area right. out there. And it becomes a wave catching contest, right? You know, and what's wrong with riding along on boards? I mean, we've all seen, you know, the old Tom Curran shot at backdoor that yeah. cutback. He could he could bury the nose and cut on a seven eight. Now, what's in the pros minds about surfing such short boards? Is it because they think they can do better maneuvers? Yeah, it's because John John wants to stuff it in the lip and like yeah. But why but, can't he do a, why can't he do it with a six six? Well, Jordy can. Jordy's yeah. stronger. Yeah. You know, like when, when I see Jordy on that appropriately long equipment, it looks amazing. Yeah. Um, Courtney Conlog riding a longer board in the final, I think it was against Malia, yeah. that she got the 10 on. Yeah. The couple of waves that she got prior to the 10, I actually thought the board was too long. I thought it was a mistake. Yeah. But that's then, when it was small in the morning. It was a lot smaller in the morning. And yeah. she had picked the smaller waves. Yeah. Then she finds herself on the set wave and she needed every... Every, every single inch of that yep. board and yep. i just thought oh i'm the idiot like she's right she picked the right board yep she just hadn't gotten on the right waves hadn't gotten on that and it was yeah. it was sort of like kelly too when you watch him jump on the simon looked amazing hello i it, know i was just like, everybody on the stairs everybody went ah there it is there it is yeah there's kelly there's the kelly we know well there was so much drive in that board well, it was, it was like, heavier. It's heavier. Yeah. It's PU. It's like, and everybody went. So that brings the whole question up. What the hell was he doing not roll? Why didn't he ride that board the whole time? Because the other boards he rode were too light. They're, that's the problem. They didn't have the drive. They had more kind of like maneuverability well, to them. Well, they're too light. But yeah, it's just too There's light no for that type of waves. Look, and even on the Simon, he only got, I think, like a four or five. It wasn't like he got great scores. But you could see the potential. Uh, like one did. of the turns he did, I know you can still see just it. so long and drawn out, yeah. and that's what the walls call for at Bells. Yeah, like that is what. Yeah, no, see. those little light top turns and stuff like little check turns and that you've got to be able to do. That's why John John won. Yeah, because he could do rail turns, and that's what Kelly could do on that board. But yeah. you know, you, you look at it and go, "Well, why didn't he keep surfing it?" It's not it, that brings up the question about. What is Kelly riding? What is he doing? Why isn't? It, why didn't he keep riding that board? Because I think, I think he rode that board. I don't really know. On the Friday, afterwards, he stayed round. 
And from all reports, it's the best Kelly surfed in five years. It's solid four to six foot winky pop. Mm. And he had a completely different board. And it's, it's a really, really basic, simple thing. It's called the law of inertia. If your board's too light, um, it's got no inertia. As soon as it hits a little bump or gets some wind under it, it stops and starts. When you've got a little bit of weight to the boards, it just means it'll cut through the chops and that. And, and it actually, it, you can actually carve and do longer lines because then you're using the, the rails of the board. You're not having to use just the tail of it and do right. little flick turns or check turns off the top. And, you know, and I think that you can see people aren't getting scored. For those waves, I mean, Kelly didn't get any really, really big scores like he used to when no, he was no. riding the PU boards. At, 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 and and that, what, that was what sort of blew me out was when you watched the advertising for um, for for the uh, WSL and showed some of the old bells. There was a couple of waves of Kelly and Parker and everything, and you watched how Kelly was surfing then on a PU board. And it's night and day. A longer board, too. Longer board, yeah. It was so gnarly. That one rail grab top turn, that's the that's one. That's the one. It's so gnarly. It's so gnarly. So and yeah. That was my thought with John John, too, is um, a couple of the turns that he was doing, I guess it was that in the lip, is different than what I've seen done at Bells before. And I don't know if he could do it on a longer board. It was almost, it was in the lip, but it was really a rail carve in yeah. the lip. Like fully buried rail but tucked up right against the yep. lip yep. so that there's actually fins kind of pushing out the back. Yep. Um, it was innovative and gnarly. Like, yeah. I, I don't know I've seen it before. Yeah, no, place. it's – you're right. The only the only time I've seen it is on guys on their backhand. Yeah, there, exactly. Which, which can go, you know – and, and Bells, exactly right. Bells is nearly a better backhand wave, I think. Yeah. You know, the waves I ride are different. They're way over on the inside. You know, another 100 metres further inside, everybody knows that low tide rink and I've got – Special boards, much faster boards than anyone else has got. Certainly not me, <laughs> you know. And you can ask all the pros. They've seen it, you know, Mick and I don't know, going all those guys, Geordie and that, and they go, how does he make those waves all the way, all the way through to where they're sort of looking in the bowl where they're taking off? I've already come 75 yards or metres, you know. Mm-hmm. And it's all about the equipment, you know, and having a much faster board and, and designing something specific for those conditions. But the backhand is like watching Oki in that, you know, and Wayne Lynch. I'm going back to Wayne Lynch and that famous shot of Barton. Barton's in the heat. Mm-hmm. Wayne's out there and Wayne's upside down under the lip. And Barton's just out in outer space. I don't know if you've ever seen that yeah. shot. It's a classic, you know. Yeah. So Wayne was doing vertical backhand reentries. Even in 1970, the first time I saw Wayne Lynch surf was at Bells in 1970 at the World Titles. And everyone's... Rolf Arnest and everyone else is doing these long speed lines down belts. Wayne was going off the bottom, straight up into the lip and hit it. Then he'd do another one and go straight up into the lip and hit it. And then usually he'd fall off on his last turn because he was going that damn fast and the equipment was this roll bottom thing. But if you put it in today's today's judging, he'd probably get a 4.5, but the others wouldn't get over one. You know what I mean? So, so I've always seen the backsiders there. Um, the backsiders actually have an advantage. You know, that's why I think you know Carolyn Marks. It's just a matter of time. You know how yeah. many bells you know she she gets because that wave suits it just like Oki. Right. You know. So, so you're right with with John John. Yeah, he's got that forehand thing, and then Medina looked so solid. Italo was hanging on for dear life. Toledo was hanging on for dear life. Jordy looked pretty good. He went to a longer board, shorter board. You know, everyone was jumping around a little bit. Like, I'm not sure whether they think that extra two inches feels a little bit because they haven't surfed a little bit too long and they can't do it. But, and you have a look at all the turns they do when they come out of barrels and stuff when they've got longer boards, you know, even backdoor. I think they're still riding step up boards, but it's a different wave. But sunset, you don't ride a 6 2 at sunset, do you? No. Huh? Or if you do, <laughs> John John might. Yeah, that's about it. He might. Yeah, but um, I know we have time constraints. We both have appointments to get to. Yep. Um, you're looking svelte. You're looking thinner than the last time I saw you. Yeah. Are you healthy? Yeah, I'm pretty healthy. I've got some got some tests coming up. I've got a few little issues always, but it's always nags there. I've got a pretty 
important bunch of tests in July, which is another defining moment. I try not to dwell on it, but well, last um, time I haven't surfed a lot, but I've, yeah, I'm losing losing a fair bit. I'm trying to trying to get back into surfing. I'm just wondering at which level now. You know? Well, last time we recorded here, uh, or the December episode, you were off to Morocco, uh, which you were hoping to surf a bunch and do a magazine piece, and then you ended up getting injured and not yeah. being able to surf. But, I'm carrying that many injuries now. I've okay. st- still got a bit of a suspect knee. I've got a stomach thing that knocks me over. I got a couple more cancer tests. I've got dodgy. I, I, I've got. <laughs> I got 53 years of surfing yeah. uh, injuries yeah. that I've never been great at doing the rehab. I've got shoulder reconstructions, things in my back, knee snap, this broken that blown ligaments all of that and it's catching up to me but it's you know i'm 65 there's actually a part of me i'm sort of alternating between i'd really like to become a successful businessman because it's like another frontier (laughs) most people retire at 65 and uh, possibly never probably never felt more relevant but probably never more vulnerable because people now know the story and it, it does. It puts you in a little bit of a. There's, you, you feel a little bit fragile sometimes, you know. And it's how you deal with that fragility, you know. And it's it's that's what I'm learning to try and do: be a lot softer and be a lot humbler. And and you know, and you know, I, I I'll be really honestly. The sunny thing has really really shaken me up. Yeah, yeah. I I. It really shook me up. It, I just and I know there'd be a lot of people feel like this. Damn, if he hadn't have been alone, um, it probably wouldn't have happened. Yeah. And the buttons that were pushed on a phone call probably probably shouldn't have happened either. But it is what it is right now. And we're dealing, and we we really are. You know, there's a lot of us are really really praying for Sunny, and we're praying for a miracle because you you know, I would. Love him to come back, not to surf, but to see if he could sit down. I would like to interview him and just pull apart his head and what that moment was like. To what end? What would be the goal? To, to what end? To show people, to show people that psychotic moment of five minutes or ten minutes or, or knowing people's pressure points, no matter who or what you are, Everybody has that same vulnerability and probably would end up doing the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's important to state no emotion is final. It all runs a course. You will change whatever emotion you're feeling. Yeah. You'll get out of that in a certain amount of time and you'll feel a different way. You have to admit it. You have to admit you've got the problem. Yeah. You've got to admit and be able to look at yourself in the mirror and not say, I'm a fuck up and go, I'm not well, I have a sickness and I have to be really, really careful and you've got to be able to define what those trigger points are, you know, like one of mine's rejection, you know, Um, (laughs) the list gets pretty long actually, (laughs) but, um, and and understand, you know, and, and I know Sonny had that too. And then when those little voices start, and he talks about the dark voices, and I talk about those dark voices, the enemy, it, it just, it takes you to a point where you feel there's no return. And if you have a psychotic episode, which is just, fuck it, you know, yeah. I'm fucking done. When that actually isn't just words, but it becomes the action, and then that's when you need someone nearby. Right. Yeah. Yeah, well, I hope that you guys are able to have that conversation. Oh, yeah. I'm praying for it, mate. Maurice, it's always a pleasure. Hey, I'll see you soon. (laughs) Thanks, mate.